And so to this evening, we're going to kick off with um, the uh, Insider program on television, which is being uh, chaired by Major General, uh, what's his name? Wirachon, sorry, Major General Wirachon, who is becoming the Michael Parkinson of Thailand uh, and interviewing all sorts of people. And uh, tonight he's interviewing uh, Norichit uh, Sin Sane, who is one of the people who drafted the constitution. Uh, this is a 15 minute slot. It's actually very interesting because it summarizes very concisely the government view on it. So we'll have a word from our sponsors first and then we'll have our panel afterwards. Stability, prosperity, and sustainability. Let's get inside. Gain the insight with the insider. Sadiqab and welcome to the Insider. I am now at the bank of the Jaipaya River, the rivers of King. It is very important river. It is the archway of the Thai people's life. Now Thailand is moving along the three phases roadmap in order to become a fully functioned democratic country and of course our democracy would be sustainable. We are at the process of the charter drafting which is very important to move forward. We are about to find out more on this detail with our special guest today. It is an honor to have Ambassador Norachit Singh Haseni, a member and a spokesperson of the Constitution Drafting Commission with us. Sadiqab. Sadiqab. My first question to you would be, what are the key characteristics of the draft charter that make this one is so unique and so special uh, compared to the previous charters? The main characteristics, one that was given by the media, it is, uh, has been dubbed the anti-corruption uh, constitution. By that, it means uh, the draft will prevent those that are corrupt, be they politicians or government officials, from remaining in their positions. Those that have been proven corrupt or have been uh, put on trial and the courts have decided that they have uh, committed wrongdoings will be prevented from uh, participating in political activities, basically being bad for life. I think that is the major uh, characteristics and something that the Thai people are looking forward to seeing. The second characteristic I would say is the issue of rights and freedoms. I think this constitution guarantees the rights and freedoms of the Thai people as well as those that are not Thais but living in Thailand. I don't think uh, any constitution provides such uh, protection to people who are not Thai nationals as this draft constitution. And again, uh, the uniqueness is the new chapter that is not only guarantees freedoms and, and rights of the Thai people, but we have put it as a duty of the state to provide such uh, necessary uh, services as public health and education. And the third and final one, I think uh, we have come through a very difficult time. So the issue of reform is very important. And this particular constitution has a special chapter on reform. Reform of the judiciary and the police, reform of education, reform of the economy. And most importantly, I think it puts a time frame. In the past, many other constitution provided that the state or the national uh, parliament has to enact new laws, but there were no specific time frames. In this particular constitution, if the state or the parliament fails to act, there are uh, clauses that will indicate what will happen 
if they do not follow the constitution. So I think these are the three main characteristics that I, I feel is quite unique for this constitution. Well, anti-corruption is one of very important issues that this government has placed as the uh, national agenda. And other topic or the other issue that is very interesting, it is um, the duty of state. So what made these charters uh, so unique and special from the others? What this constitution has tried to do is to go one step further. In the past, uh, if any group or any community wishes to be uh, sure that their rights and freedom are protected, they would have to fight for it. They would have to protest. They would have to call on the government, the parliament, to enact such laws. We've seen it in the past. What this draft constitution has done is we have seen that such a constitution, time has passed. Many laws have already been uh, enacted for residents environmental. You now have uh, EIAs, you all have the studies before any project can be implemented. So rather than having to go back to those times where you had to fight for your rights and freedoms, this constitution created a new chapter called the duty of the state. It is not the power of the state, but the duty, duty. the duty of the state. So have this been informed to, to the public? We have tried to make this uh, widely known as possible. And that is where we have encountered criticism. Because some people do not read the whole constitution. They read the chapter on rights and freedoms, and they feel that some things are missing. But you need to read the whole constitution. When you get to the chapter on the duty of the state, you will see that on the issue of education, on the issue of public health, this is provided by the state, not the power of the state. The state does not have any uh, decision-making process. They must provide this. They must provide education. They must provide public health. It is clear what the state needs to do. If the state fails to do it, the people, community, can petition them to do it. If they still fail to do it, they can take the government to court. That is, you can sue the government. What would be the benefit uh, that this constitution would, be, uh, would provide to the people? The constitution will be able to pave the way for the Thai people, the country, to return to democracy. I think we need definite rules and, and, and uh, the way f to go forward. The constitution will provide the uh, rough guidelines. There will be additional laws that need to be enacted. That is number one. Number two, I think the Thai people can be quite certain that their rights and freedoms are protected. Number three, as we were talking about the reform, I think there is common understanding that the country needs reform in many sectors to be able to return to democracy, to be able to compete in the international community in order to, to maintain the progress of the country, to maintain stability and grow the economy. So the constitution is a framework that will allow for all this. I think what is important for the people to realize is, number one, uh, they can be sure that their rights and, and freedoms are protected. Number two, they will be freely uh, able to elect the next government through the ballot box. I think that is most important. And number three, we hope that the charter will be able to bring about a better government in, in the sense that the government will be responsive to the needs of the people and not seek power just, just to enrich themselves and their cronies or their followers. I think that is something that the Thai people want to see, a clean government. Well, one thing that's very important is the social disparity. Will this new charter resolve you know, this issue to reduce the social disparity? 
Well, it attempts to do so. I don't think you can solve the issue overnight, but uh, as examples, uh, education. Uh, now, the education will be provided even at the preschool level, free of charge. So I think that is one important point where you don't have to be uh, rich to send your children to kindergarten. So what this charter does is to create parity there. Number one, you don't have to spend money to send your children to kindergarten. Also on public health, everyone will be entitled to uh, health services provided by the state. It may be through some insurance scheme, uh, the uh, gold card, the uh, social uh, security, or the prakan uh, sangkom, all that will remain. But the emphasis is on those in need, those with disability, those who are in poverty, those people will be receiving assistance from the state. That is assured. Well, it seems to me that the CDC maintains that the new charter would have to respond to the uniqueness of the Thai society. But what about the international concern or universal concern? Well, we have been very careful because that is the term of reference that was given to us by the uh, NCPO that while drafting this constitution, it should reflect the uniqueness of Thai society or Thai political traditions, but at the same time, it must adhere to international uh, standards. What we have done is to look at our own constitution. We have compared it to our international obligations. The most important one would be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The other one, which uh, Thailand is a party to, is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We are a party to it. When we completed our constitution drafting process, we went through the uh, convention to see that all the rights and freedoms are protected on your individual rights, your rights to uh, practice any religion, the rights to your own home, uh, rights to, to, to education, every particular uh, issue on rights and freedoms, we have ensured that they correspond to the international covenant. So I think in that sense, we are quite sure that our draft constitution is up to international standard, if that is the point. What would be your key message to the people regarding the new charter? Two short points. Uh, number one, the constitution, like all documents, is just a document. It is the highest uh, law in the land, but it provides the framework. Whether it will be workable, whether the Thai politics can change, whether we have a responsible government, a clean government, depends on those that utilize it. Uh, if politicians can think of the uh, overall uh, picture and, and the uh, country and the people as a whole and be able to compromise and be able to uh, work together, uh, not just to retain power or keep power. I think that is the most important one. No document can do that. Only the people can do that, particularly the politicians. And number two, for the Thai people who will be participating in the referendum on the 7th, uh, I would urge you to, to find out what in your mind is the most important or vital uh, provisions for you. Is it your rights and freedoms? Is it your ability to elect your own representative and the government? And seek the answer by yourself. Don't listen to anyone. You may listen to them and have questions in your head, but try to find out and don't be misled by anyone. Just uh, 
find as much information as you can. It's all out there in, in the internet, in the websites, in documents that the National Election Commission will be sending to you in your household. Just read it and make up your own mind what is best for the country. And with this, I believe that uh, we would be able to achieve our goal that is Thailand having security, stability and sustainability. We all wish that. So the cap and back. Good. So if I could invite uh, my distinguished speakers to the stage. Um, as you, yeah, please come. So we're going to take a look at uh, what's happening on uh, Sunday. And the premise of the program tonight is to try and wheedle out things that are different about this constitution from the ones that we've had before. Um, this, is, this will be the 20th. It could be described as the 21st because the last draft constitution was still born and abandoned. Uh, and as we've said, it's the second one that will be uh, adopted by a referendum or rejected. And uh, at the moment, there's all this speculation about what the turnout's going to be, whether it's going to be at 80%, it was, as was predicted by Somchai Sisutiakon, uh, one of the election commissioners. Uh, and if it did turn out to be a very high turnout, and actually others have predicted an even higher one, um, would that be because there was a, a rallying against it by the red shirt heartlands up in the north and the northeast? All that is speculative. Um, to give us a rundown um, this evening on what is different, we have a very distinguished panel. We have Dr. Suchit Bumbong Khan, who is uh, a very uh, familiar face at the FCCT over the years, was very regular up at the Dusitani. He's Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Chulalongkorn University, uh, and very interestingly served as a constitutional court judge in the early 2000s, when there were some interesting uh, verdicts delivered. Uh, and served b before that for, uh, as an advisor to Prime Minister Prem Tinsulanand in the 80s um, and was also a member of the Constitutional Drafting Assembly in 1997 which produced the People's uh, Constitution which was the one that lasted the longest. It lasted nine years until it was knocked out in 2006. Um, and Dr. Suchit has a, a huge range of um, writings to his credit in English and Thai. Uh, to his left, we have uh, Dr. David Streckfuss, uh, who is uh, director of the CIEE Thailand Council on International Educational Exchange, a program at Konken University in Thailand. Uh, and he's a founding member and advisor to the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Network of Thailand. Uh, David is, uh, took his PhD in Southeast Asian history from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and has written numerous articles and books. He's the author of Truth on Trial in Thailand, Defamation, Treason, and Les Majest, uh, a very important work. Uh, and at the other end, we have Henning Glazer, who is, I bet this is your first time at the club, isn't it? Yes, so welcome. Uh, who's been teaching German and comparative constitutional law at Tamasat University, uh, the faculty of law there since 2007. And in 2009, he became a founding director of the German Southeast Asian Center of Excellence for Public Policy and Good Governance. And I think that's something we, we would all endorse. Um, so I thought this evening we'd kick off with Dr. Suchit, who has a very long-term view uh, of um, Thai constitutions and has been involved in drafting them and, is, and will um, give us a few uh, pointers as to what is, what is worth looking at this time. Dr. Suchit. Thank you. 
Dominic. And I'm very glad to be here again uh, after quite a while uh, stay away. The, in the 90s and uh, early uh, 2000s, I was a rather quite a frequent visitor to the club. And because of the political situation, it forced me to say something on uh, uh, to you on the developments and the prospect of our political developments. And once, you know, once you, you are getting old, you try to stay home. You try not to come out and challenge here and there and say, oh, I don't like it, you see, you better do this and better do that, you see. So I need to have the, the next generation to come up you see, and say something uh, uh, instead of the allowing a people like right this age uh, to go on and on and on forever, which is not very good for our academic circle. Nevertheless, you see, since I understand that Dominic will fi would fight some rather difficulties in finding someone who, who dare up, uh, dare to speak up here, uh, because uh, NCPO quite a bit uh, strict on the debates on the constitutions, debates on the whether you would want to vote for the referend uh, f uh, in uh, vote for or against in the referendum. So my point of view is, see, I don't want to go in detail. Now, what I should be uh, doing on the, on the, on this uh, Sunday, if you ask, see, is it the is it the draft? Is uh, I like it or not? I cannot tell because I was the one who draft the first one, the one that was uh, thrown out by the uh, National Reform Council. But I do believe that mine is the best. <laughs> well, I, I got a reason. Uh, because uh, mine is the best because a number of articles mentioned by Kunal uh, Rajit, uh, you see, he mentioned about the uniqueness of, this cons of, of the present draft, you see, very similar to what I, I wrote, you see, earlier, very similar. The, 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 the human rights uh, guarantees the uh, eradication effort uh, to of the corruption practices by politicians so on and so forth so more or less is the same but the emphasis might be different in terms of uh, election procedure the elections uh, system under the present constitution is uh, different from the one uh, uh, under the present uh, draft, I'm sorry, uh, uh, is not uh, uh, similar to what I uh, we, we draft uh, because we we use the the so-called German system, and we will attack that uh, you are borrowing foreign uh, elements into our constitutions. But don't forget, you see, most of the constitutions we have had so far since 1932 borrow from the West. More or less, you see, but we are keen to amend it, to revise it, uh, to fit in our uh, political situation in a particular time. So in the past, uh, when I was asked, you see, how come Thailand has too many constitutions? So within the 80 to 90 years, since 1932, we have about 18 or 19 constitutions, let alone the interim constitutions. Uh, so we have, we have quite a number. So the point is, you see, whenever you have uh, any, some undesirable situation occur, uh, quote unquote, see, yeah, uh, from the point of view of the leaders, from the point of view of the people, from the point of view of uh, political groups, so on and so forth, so they need to write a new constitution. In other words, see, the, the new constitution want to address the ills the ill, the sickness of society at that time, and do hope that it would help. But once, when, once it come into effect, it didn't help. Then the people said, okay, why don't we throw it away? You see, it, it might be thrown away by, by the cook group, it might throw it away by elected government, so on and so forth, you see, and then they introduce a new one to address a new issues, to address a new illness of our society. But the point is, you see, the, uh, you cannot 
resolve all the problems in the country by relying on constitutions alone. That that my point. You see, so we need to have some other thing as well. And this I would like to point out that when we were drafting the first draft uh, two years ago, we agree that. Uh, Okay, we need to add some new elements into the constitutions. I try to address the issue that was raised in the past uh, uh, decades, uh, ten or twenty uh, uh, years ago, about uh, the uh, corruptions among politicians, corruptions among high-ranking officers, so on and so forth. So I agree that we need to put. Something in the draft of the in in the draft in order to enable the governments and the counter corruption agencies uh, to do to to have a power more in order to to uh, to eliminate or to reduce the rate of corruption. But once we try to in the past, but once we try to to enact it, like in 1997, I. I would like to point out, you see, before 1997, we have the so-called counter-corruption uh, commission uh, of government officers. I was the one who chaired the last commission, of, the last commission in, in 1997. But we were, we were criticized that that particular counter-corruption commission of government officers, of government, it was rather a paper tiger because we we were not armed to do anything right just simply okay investigate and then send the case to the police and so on and so forth so in 1997 we adopt a new agency that's why we call it counter corruption agency Papa Chaw. and we hope we we believe that with the the, the ammunition given to the to them, that through the constitution, they would be able to do and to do a lot of things in uh, in get rid of the, those corrupt politicians and government officers. But still, those still in power, and those who out of power were the counter corruption commission itself. <laughs> Some of them were put to jail, but the politicians still survive, stay out of jail. In other words, you see, so so it's quite interesting to see see how 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 it works. So my point is that I agree that you see I don't want to go into detail, but I would like to 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 uh, point out uh, three or four things that it would happen to the country after after we have the the new constitutions, uh, the constitution whether it would be the one drafted by this commission or the one drafted by the NCPO itself once uh, the, the drafted one failed uh, to pass uh, the referendum. So uh, I would like to point out that okay, the, we will have an elected government definitely. Uh, the roadmap of, uh, announced by the government that we will have elections uh, next year, 2017, no matter how, what happened uh, with the outcome of the referendum, I agree to this. Because the pressure within and outside is very strong that the government cannot resist to, to postpone the election to another year or two or three years, you see. Although some portions of the people would like to stay on with this power. They seem, uh, the government seems to be quite effective, these people believe. But of course, you see, Kun Prayut know quite well that it's not very good for him, it's not very good for the country, and not very good for, he, for his government to, uh, to uh, postpone uh, the election. So I, I believe that elected government would be uh, instilled uh, in some time. Uh, uh, install, I'm sorry, uh, around uh, 2017, uh, uh, see, uh, maybe at the end of 2017. But what the people want out of this, const out of the new uh, 
constitutional rule. I would say constitutional rule. You see, not the constitution itself, <laughs> the constitution rule that they want a reconciliation between various groups. See the uh, United Front of Democracy, uh, the group that uh, governed by Kun Sutep, and see Kokopaso and other groups as well. You see how they can come up and work together. In other words, that they don't want to see political divisiveness. They don't want to see political polarization. Of course, no one wants to see it. Um, but the question is, does the new government can do this? I would assume that political divisiveness and political polarization will continue after the elections, after the elected government. Because you can see that uh, groups, uh, particular groups which are doing something underground, you know that underground, you see, continue to work real hard in order to make their presence felt. We still there, don't forget us, you see, we still there, and those who are in Dubai still said, okay, I'm still there, you see, no, uh, we are waiting for the next election for the new government, so on and so forth, you see. And Kun Sute, one is I said, oh, I'm still here, I'm still here, I will be a whistleblower to, uh, to rally the people to vote for the refer for the constitution, for the draft, for the draft in the, in, on, on Sunday, okay. So, uh, the Divisiveness and polarization will continue. But the point is, you see, the intensity of the conflicts will be less than uh, what we have had before the coup of May uh, 2014. Uh, I would think that the United Front of Democracy and other anti-military groups, uh, uh, or the Red Church movement, will, will, will try to seek every possible opportunities uh, to exert influence through the elected government to the elected body of the parliament to some of the representatives. People might say that under the, the, the new constitution we might have new faces in parliament. I do agree, yes, we might have some new faces, but you know quite well that it's not very easy for all these new faces to run and win in the election. Election in Thailand is quite different. If you are not uh, an old pro in politics, it's not very easy for you to get elected. Uh, so very few uh, come newcomers would be able to win, but not ma very many. There might be some new faces but backed by a number of the old politicians who were not, who were, who are not uh, able to run because of the their record in corruption, so on, so forth. See? But they would be able to to finance. They would be able to back new faces. Kun uh, David know quite well because you are in Konkan, you know very well. Uh, the issue of nominee is quite something, it's not new in Thai politics. And this is the thing that I'm not very sure that the present, uh, the new elected government will be able to do anything to reconcile the conflict of various groups. And, uh, but the part is intensity would be less. It would be less, why? Because the second point, uh, the, you have to look at the relationship between the, the elected government and the military. It is obvious that uh, the military leaders in the NCPO uh, will never want to relinquish their power very easily or immediately after the election. Uh, they will continue to play a very vital role in setting up the government. They don't want to be a king makers, but who knows? Who knows, you see? No. Because if the parliament is composed of very, very small parties, and these small parties will, will lack uh, very competent leaders to become prime minister, then a close consultation with these smaller parties and uh, military people will be uh, occurring. 
uh, and people might think how about pure Thai and Democrat it seems to me that the NCPO will never want pure Thai and Democrat to run the government never and Kun Apisit no I know whether Kun Thaksit no Vakka well or not but Kun Apisit Apisit no and from my point of view the Democrat will be in Democrat's party it will be in the better shape in the opposition they know how to run as the opposition of the government but they don't know much to run the country as the government that's the problem of Democrat for along if you look at the 70 years of the Democrat party they enjoy being an opposition but once they were in power they would be split that's the problem for Democrat the reason that why they last from 19 uh, uh, 47 up until now why they last that long because most of the time they remain in opposition that's the point okay uh, so for the point is you see not only setting up the government the military will continue to play a vital role in overseeing the so-called national security issues it might be possible that one of the leaders of the NCPO would be prime minister I I've emphasized one of the leaders I didn't say the leaders one of the leaders you see because I'm not a, a astronomer I don't know how to guess you see one so uh, but even so even the uh, one of the members of NCPO become prime minister uh, the the line dividing the uh, the authority or responsibility in terms of national security between the government and military uh, not very clear but the point is you see I would say that it would be left to the army to decide under what circumstances they might come in uh, in the draft in the draft they would ask the president of the constitutional court to call a meeting of the prime ministers the house speaker the leader of oppositions the uh, the commanders of the armed forces and three uh, armies navy and police and air force so on so forth uh, to sit down and uh, discuss how to cope with that undesirable situation would be occurring at that time but i do believe the president of the constitutional court will not want to act alone before they call for a meeting they would ask the army chief the army chief only would you like to would you like me to call a meeting and if army leaders say no no meeting occur believe me so so this is the thing that uh, I would say that no matter what you write it down in the constitution is one thing the practice is another so so I would like to conclude by saying that you see uh, because of this setting up between uh, the governments the elected one and the militaries so the question of legitimacy always occur why the legitimacy have to step in the people why agree that okay because it's written in the Constitution but I would say that the concept in the Constitution alone is not enough to give legitimacy to the government so I would say that the government effectiveness is also essential uh, to what extent you can uh, pre present to the people that your government is clean your government is dedicated yourself to the happiness of the people that one thing in addition a reform of a criminal justice system quote unquote police and other so and so I don't want to say police you see the criminal justice system need to be reformed and the more you you fight for it the more power the police have I don't know what happened <laughs> and then uh, the other thing is you see 
I don't think the constitution alone is not enough. So, so what we trying to do, and no one want want to make it more serious. And it's from my point of view, it's very serious. The the concept of citizenship, the concept of democratic democratic political cultures, must be effectively instilled in the populace. And this take times, take years. It's not very easy because you cannot run the government with the constitution alone. We cannot run the country with the okay bureaucracies and parliaments and the prime minister and so on and so forth. But how about the people? In Western society, the government seems to function well because the people are alert of what the people in the power were doing and doing for whether they are doing for the sake of the country or not, or they, they want to do it for, for themselves. So this is the thing that um, I would like to, to point out, that the development of political culture in terms of citizenship, in terms of believing in democracy, and in terms of uh, 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 rule of law is a must. But the point is, you see, what we are facing in the future is diversity of political thinking and beliefs must be tolerated. This will not disappear from in our society. It will be there, but how can we work together? You see, with the audio diversity of political differences. In Europe, you have a Communists, you have right wing, you have right wing, you have the my socialist, you have so on, you have Republican, you have monarchy, and so on and so forth. But in a country, okay, we cannot go that far. But one basic concept need to be instilled is the constitutional monarchy is a must for the country. And then with the constitutional monarchy is a must, you need to strike a balance between order and stability. This is a very tough question, and this this uh, this balance between order and stability has been has been argued, argue, you see, argue since the day is of Plato and Aristotle, and continue to this day. But despite that, we need to achieve. Or otherwise, you see, we will end up with 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 so and so. Cool again and again and again and again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Suchit. So, David, what uh, catches your discerning eye? Um, well, I have to say I'm the, uh, I'm the weak link in tonight's program. Um, the other two speakers have a lot of experience and are, are experts in that field. Um, and to boot, um, I have been very unengaged over the last year really unable to look at what's going on in Thailand without getting very worked up so I, I've thought of other things so when Dominic asked me I thought I need to get back involved in looking at things and so that maybe they add something to when I went through this constitution and compared it with some past constitutions to see where we stand uh, with rather fresh eyes because my assumption was that this if if the 2007 constitution had been created by a hand-picked constitution drafting committee had barely passed well it barely passed in the north it didn't pass in the northeast but passed uh, nationwide um, and that constitution was turned out to be too uh, conservative for many um, many in the political parties and there was even a movement to try to go back to the 1997 constitution then there's a coup the 2007 constitution is is eliminated and you know one question is why was it eliminated did it cause the problem was it because what was laid out in the 19 or the 2007 constitution lead to the problem why did it have to be why is this kind of gut reaction of having to eliminate the the previous constitution always at play 
And then it looked like the, the, the next draft was going this way. Um, the first draft constitution. I assumed that this, co this draft was going to be even further away from what I see as kind of the uh, democratic aspirations of a lot of people well, in the Northeast and throughout the country. So I, I was disengaged, but I've looked at it and so I, I saw some things there and I looked back through all the, uh, at least skimmed through all the, all the previous constitutions um, to try to get a sense of like where this constitution is. So first I thought, so let's look at the, uh, the composition. Um, this constitution draft promises 500 elected uh, members, of the, members of parliament or members of the House of Representatives versus 200 appointed. That's about a 71% of the parliamentarians would be coming from that. How does that compare with previous constitutions? Uh, maybe the red shirts pushed too hard in trying to make the, elect the Senate completely elected in November or October and November of 2014 because the 2007 constitution was 88%. I mean, it, it, it been very, it very hard in a way for them to do much um, uh, against the the will of the of the people. Let's say, how does that compare? The 1997 Constitution was, of course, 100 <laughs> percent elected parliamentarian. So that one stands as as a, a milestone in Thai history and compares only with the 1946 Constitution in which there were 176 members of Parliament and another uh, uh, 80 senators, but the senators themselves were elected by the uh, members of Parliament, or the, the, the members of uh, the House of, um, uh, by the House. So even that is, is kind of an indirect elected. So the 1997 Constitution really stands out. If we go further back, um, I would say this, cons this 1974 um, Constitution had 75% elected members. Um, and the probably most, most uh, close to what we're seeing now is 57, 71, 57 percent were elected under the 1978 Constitution. And maybe that's what this Constitution represents in terms of composition. Um, I am assuming here, and maybe this is not a fair assumption, that Constitutions are created ideally to reflect the will of the majority. Right? And that um, regardless of corruption or anything else that politicians might be doing, if they're reflecting the will of who they're representing, then that system is working under a dem democratic system. Um, and then there could be obstacles to that, to that will. And when we think about the things that, that uh, I'll just, I know this is complicated, but I'll just call pro-democracy people, have been fighting for, you know, two prime ministers have been uh, knocked out by the, by the courts. There have been two uh, elections annulled. There have been um, two coups. Um, and, you know, that will, that thwarting the will of the majority again and again and again might have some... Th so th that's why I'm thinking about the, the kind of... Uh, Composition, does it make any difference? Okay. So then I looked at no confidence votes because that's a check on the government and it's important. In the 1997 Constitution, for the Prime Minister required um, two-fifths or 40% of members of the House of Representatives in order to call a uh, a, a debate on vote of, co of confidence for the government um, and 20% for cabinet members. That was a very high threshold. The highest, in fact. Before and after, it's been one out of five or 20%. And, but the lowest threshold was the Preeti Panomyong government in 1946, which had a 16% 
threshold to, to in order to question the government and maybe bring it down. Um, so this constitution, it, this present draft is 20%. So it fits the fits the um, the 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 regular stand the kind of the standard approach. Um, this constitution does not is not clear where the prime minister comes from. Um, it's not specified. It sounds like it could be someone uh, from outside, and that makes it similar. There hasn't been, you know, Thailand has now spent, not counting when there's been a coup, for elected governments, it's had elected prime ministers since 1997, um, or at least since the since the constitution came into effect after that election, um, and we'd have to go back to the 1978 the 1980s when Prem was prime minister, not never elected, um, to get something like that. So okay, well that's a little different, all right. And what will that lead to? Probably maybe because of the voting, uh, it's not stealing from the German system. It'll be weak coalition governments. Those weak coalition governments might call upon someone from the outside, maybe a military leader to come in and, and uh, take them on. So maybe that will happen. It's also for needed for crisis. If there's a crisis, what do you do? Um, in, a, in a way, uh, you know, constitutions also are supposed to put, put a check on people. And so uh, what kind of check did previous, uh, in terms of... Um, um, impeachment powers. What does this constitution have? This is very strange. Um, the 2007 constitution had, if two-thirds of the Senate voted for it, could impeach someone. Now remember that was half elected and half appointed Senate. This would be a completely appointed Senate, but it does not in this draft constitution have uh, impeachment powers um, and so how would that work well the Constitution places almost all its powers um, through a through a, 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 a select committee um, in the independent organizations and I suppose those are supposed to keep check on politicians in ways that not. But it, it makes you wonder why was there a coup in the first place? Why was the con why did the constitution have to change? After all, the NCPO has said the problem was that there was social division and possible conflict and violent conflict, and so they had to put it down. Why do you have to get rid of the constitution any more than the 1997 constitution had to somehow be eliminated as if it was somehow the cause? A lot of these things, I've, I heard on the radio the other day, government radio, um, that uh, this constitution is the, and you heard on this video, it's the anti-corruption constitution. Well, okay, and there's 50, um, uh, 50 measures in there, in the uh, provisions in the, in the constitution to try to eliminate uh, corruption perfectly, as he said. Well, I mean, not everything, as, as Dr. Sujit said, not everything needs to go into the Constitution. There, it is true there is a little bit more, st a stronger conflict of interest law uh, provisions in this Constitution, but why does everything have to go into this? Why couldn't it just come out through regular laws? Um, so if that's the case, wh why, so I come back to the question, why, why, do we even, why are we even talking about a new draft? Why wasn't the 2007 Constitution merely amended and then some laws passed to make that happen? Well, I think in some ways the 2007 Constitution had, had worked. It had worked for those who had elected a government into it and despite this and that and the other, they couldn't quite knock out the Puatai government. And they tried their best with independent organizations. The Senate was maybe going to vote on Yinglak, but Yinglak got kicked out before. Um, and they couldn't quite get rid of it, so they, had, so they thought they had to have a coup to fix it. Um, and so in a way, the system sort of worked. The Constitution was able to accommodate it, kept in the elected government. Um, in power, but of course then it was taken over. Um, 
So, I do, but I think that the, the real good part of this Constitution is not in its main body. It looks like the other ones. There's nothing new. Um, there's nothing that interesting. There, are, Yeah, you can see the anti-corruption to be an ethical and moral person and so on in there. Um, but that's not, that's not new. And there might be more of them. So what's really new about this? What's really new about this is in the transitory... Uh, well, I guess there's two things. First, the amendment process. As the Senate is no longer mixed between appointed and elected, it requires two, uh, to even start, start up, it requires three, three fifths of a vote to make an amendment, uh, which means, or maybe two fourths from the Senate itself. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, two fifths out of the, the, the Senate itself. Well, the Senate is, is all uh, appointed. So it's probably not possible to ever amend this again, at least under present terms. Um, that's a surprise, but it, you know, people have talked about that. The other surprise is in the transitory provisions. The transitory provisions say that the, under, under this Constitution, the Senate will be appointing the members of the independent organizations. Uh, it will be doing this and that. It also says that before there's elections, the National Legislative Assembly will be functioning as both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Thus, it will be that body that will be putting into motion and approving the organic laws. And there's about 10 organic laws, some new ones, that are connected to this Constitution, which are going to be a surprise to everyone. Maybe, who knows what's in there? But if you vote for the Constitution, then you're also voting for a surprise laws. Um, and, and there's no way to, say, to think about what, maybe some of those tougher measures are going to be in those laws. We don't know. Um, but it also, and this is the most inter interesting, painful thing, the NCPO is going to be basically selecting out of a pool all the senators. And the NCPO doesn't, there's nothing in the Constitution that says the NCPO will stop doing this function. They could stay in power forever. So by voting on this Constitution, a rather standard one, not quite as bad as I thought, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, you're voting in the NCPO to be basically installed legally for the foreseeable future. Um, and given that, I'm not sure that the average villager gets all the way to the bottom, um, because I thought it was almost over, and then it, it, there was still a lot more. It also says all the laws by the NCPO, the hundreds of laws and announcements, directives, all remain legal. That would mean even after an elected government. All these things that we see that are suppressing free, freedom of speech will stay in play. So. Um, you know, you get more than just a constitution by voting for this draft. You'd get the NCPO forever and ever. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a, a minor nitpick. Uh, Chachai was elected, so actually prime ministers from the late 80s forward were elected. Uh, Chachai Chuan. Um, uh, just before I go to Henning, I just want to ask you some very quick questions. Have there been any amendments to the laws on succession, uh, abdication? Not yet. Not yet. So. Not yet. But because the a NL NLA, the National Legislative Assembly, will be functioning as a Senate and a thing, anything, any changes of that, of the succession law, would go through them. Right. So Henning, are you... Uh, Ready to go? Do you need any help? No. Welcome to the FCC team. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, time to shit. <coughs> David, uh, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to say first that I feel always a little bit odd when I talk about uh, constitution making in Thailand as a foreigner before foreigners. I do that quite often now in these days, but um, I want to reiterate that I am not trying to judge anything. 
I just give you, I share my impressions with you, my humble private impressions as a lawyer and uh, analyst of constitutions. First of all, I would like to say that we have to understand a little bit the background of this constitution making. Thailand is in a deep divisional crisis and this has to be seen as um, totally the overarching um, matrix of the whole process. If you now see what the constitution offers, the draft constitution, I totally agree with David that we have a constitution which is offering not so much new elements. It is uh, continuing, but in an int intensified mode, what we know from Thai constitutionalism since a long time. Thai constitutionalism is always or has always been fundamentally anti-electoral. Electoral politics have been a very important element of Thai constitutionalism, but in the same time they have been dubious and they have been considered as being dangerous. And this is a characteristic which Thai constitutionalism shares with constitutionalism in America in the 18th and 19th century and in Europe. We had the same stance in the West, but we overcame that. However, looking at this draft constitution, we see a kind of radicalization of this anti-electoral stance. Um, I will focus in my short um, description of this draft on the setup of the government, the architecture of the constitution, if you want to call it like that. And I want to see how the constitutional process will develop in the future. When we see now the situation, we have to see that there are, in fact, two separated but interconnected uh, crises, deep crises of the country. We have a transformative crisis pertaining to the normative order that is disputed. We have two totally different conceptions of how the country should be governed, two conceptions of governance, or maybe even three. If you would say we have the established one, we have the uh, one of uh, Kuntaksim and the one of uh, some red shirts which have maybe a different one than Kuntaksim. So it is a transformative crisis about the normative order. But until now, we have always, as a constitution, as a supreme law of the land, one concept embodied in the constitution. Then we have also a transitional crisis. Um, I just want to make sure that this is uh, seen. This is a very important thing. We have two crises, and obviously um, both crises have to be addressed by the Constitution, and there we have more or less uh, three strategies. We have um, the strategy of exclusiveness pertaining to the rearm of party politics and every challenge of the established system. It's a very exclusive process. Then we have um, a lifting of the anti-electoral stance of the um, constitutional law to a new level. It is very much anti-electoral now. And we have a focus on the problem to guarantee continuation at the nation's center of gravity concerning the political power. So that is very important for the Constitution, that there is continuity. If I uh, might sum up um, very briefly um, the draft, what the draft is offering. First of all, we have a shift from uh, more legal constitutionalism to a more moral, political constitutionalism that is very visible in section uh, 5 of the Constitution, which is one of the most important sections. I have not the time to elaborate that. I could talk long about this section, because this section reflects fundamentally the change of Thai politics we already witnessed. But I will not talk about that. We might talk about it later. What we can see in Article 5 is at least that in the situation of national crisis, there will be a committee, and that committee will decide politically, not legally. So this is very important, and um, this is a characteristic we find all over the draft. Secondly, talking about rights, there is not so much new, but compared to the draft um, of uh, 2015, which has been also um, done by Tan Sushit, uh, rights are weaker. Rights have been stronger in the other draft than the first draft, only one uh, example, uh, the first draft uh, presented uh, 
basic rights and fundamental rights, while this draft, like all other constitutions, is granting only the rights of the Thai people, the rights and duties of the Thai people, chapter 3 of the constitution. So it is not uh, more than in the past, but um, more or less the same. Talking about the independent uh, constitutional organizations, there is also not so much change. We have there a tendency to more bureaucratization. We have the same selection procedure for all of them. We have uh, an in increase pertaining to the criteria, so it is more difficult to become a member of these institutions. The ranks which are required are higher, the professional experience is longer, and sometimes uh, even 20 years you need um, to, to be eligible. We have also no NGO representatives anymore among the eligible candidates. And we can say that in terms of function and competencies, the independent agencies rather lost a little bit by it than that they gained some, if you look very carefully in the Constitution. Talking about the Constitutional Court, there is not so much change. It remains more or less the same. Um, pertaining to amendments, they are indeed very, very difficult. Uh, just one fact about that. We need now 20% of the members of Parliament who are not represented with their parties in government. That means 20% of the opposition has to agree. That is also significant, and that means indeed amendments are quite improbable. Um, <clears throat> now I would like uh, to turn to the uh, government structure. Uh, there we have a tendency of um, weakening the electoral system. Electoral democracy is more weakened than ever before. I give you only two examples how much uh, politicians are now um, potentially weakened. Section 224 allows for the temporary suspension of the right to stand in elections on the ground of suspicion only of a dishonest act in an election. That is very far going, given the fact that the Constitution also grants uh, the presumption of innocence. So the suspicion is enough for a temporary suspension. Section 235 is even giving the possibility of a life ban from standing as a candidate in elections for serious violations of ethical standards. This is also a very, very sharp weapon which might be directed at politicians. Only two examples um, to show how potentially weak politicians are now. Furthermore, political parties will be institutionally weakened as such. They will be much weaker. Um, in terms of election law, bigger parties will lose. That affects especially Poitai and Pachatipat party. Um, while middle-sized parties will relatively gain um, in elections and in general, given that we have a weak parliament consisting of weak politicians and weak political parties, which is highly fragmented, we will have a weak government too, because the government in the parliamentary system is dependent on the parliament. Beside that, the parliament is also uh, the government is also weakened um, in, in certain concrete uh, respects. Only two examples. We have now a change. There is a lesson learned from the impeachment of uh, Kun Ying Lak. The lesson learned is that the ministers are now dependent in their fate of the prime minister. That means if the prime minister is impeached, the cabinet is axed too. That was different, that was why the coup was necessary, because after the impeachment of Ying Lak, still there has been a Thai government. That changed. Then a second, more important change uh, pertains to the um, responsibility of the cabinet. The cabinet uh, is now responsible uh, for the um, policies it is announcing, and very important, every minister is collectively responsible for um, these for the determination and implementation of the cabinet's policies. This is something very, very vague and we have to see how much this might be turned into a strong weapon against the cabinet. Crucial will be the formation of a new government. Right now, in a certain sense, we have to talk here about three different constitutions. 
that is important to see and to distinguish. First of all, we have the present interim constitution of 2014, which already contains very significant decisions. Think only about section 44, but there are also other very important decisions. For example, the change of the former section 7, which is now section 5. However, the most important section is section 44, and this section will remain in force after the enactment of the draft constitution until the new government is created. In a certain sense, section 44 is a constitution on its own. Then, second and third, the draft constitution is offering two forms or two constitutions, if you want. We have, first of all, the draft constitution in the transitional form and in the post-transitional form. That means there is, for five years, a different constitutional setup, um, which is really significantly different pertaining to the physics of power and the center of gravity of the constitutional order. The transitional constitution, which will be the constitution for five years, is a constitution which is very, very decisive for the future of Thailand because it's reaching much more beyond uh, than only five years. What are the features? The features which differentiate these two constitutions in one document are basically pertaining to the Senate. The first five years, the Senate will firstly be comprised by more people. There will be a higher number, not only 200, but 250 people in the Senate. Secondly, the transitional Senate will be um, differently composed. It will be appointed basically by the NCPO, while after the five years, the composition is a different one, which is complicated, but um, we have to notify now, it is now, for the first five years, composed um, on behalf of the NCPO. And certainly, very much important, most importantly, the Senate is contributing to the election of the Prime Minister. This is really very, very important. Um, I have um, some graphs here. I think I cannot show them to you, but I want to give you some numbers, what that means. We will have all in all, 750 people who vote the, for the next Prime Minister. We have 500 MPs and we have 250 members of Parliament, of the House of Representatives. The majority we need to elect a Prime Minister is 376 votes out of 750. And that means, if the Senate is voting in a block, and we can assume that, we have 250 votes of the Senate, plus only 126 votes out of 500 elected votes necessary to create a Prime Minister. And that means with 25% of the MPs, we can create a Prime Minister, 25%. Now, how can that be organized? If we assume that the Poi Thai Party will not vote in favor of a Prime Minister who is um, representing the um, government in being now, we have three parties basically which might create the Prime Minister. And again, we need only 25% of all the MPs. These parties are Pachatipat, the Democrat Party, Bumjai Thai Party, and Cha Thai Patana Party. If the new election system is um, how we might calculate it. These parties will have, in the case of the Democrat Party, 160 votes, given the last results of the last election, 56 for Bumjai Thai, and for Chad Thai Patana, 24. These parties can easily form together the necessary, not majority, the necessary quorum of 126 people. It would be enough if Bumjai Thai Party would vote in bloc and if parts of Democrat Party and parts of Cha Thai Patana Party would vote together with this bloc. We know that uh, Khun Su Thep's faction of the Democrat Party is in favor of the Constitution and we might assume that it will also be in favor of 
a government which is representing the same power who made that constitution. So this is a very important uh, scenario and we might add to that scenario that we also might have a new party. This is nothing new, we had that in 1992 in Thailand. In 1992 in Thailand, there was the Justice Unite Party. The Justice Unite Party was a military party founded in 1991, and already in 1992, they were the strongest party in the national election. So this is possible. And they were dissolved in the same year. So parties can come very quickly and be successful. The same is true for New Aspiration Party of uh, Tan Chowalit was also very successful for a short time and then it vanished by merging with Tairak Thai party. So this kind of new party would even make it more easier to form a new government. This party, there are some rumors about uh, um, Kun Vishai, uh, who's close to um, Kun Anutin, Kun Nevin, um, reported to be close, to, to be careful. So then if there is a new party, we would have a new party and we would have Democrat Party, split off of Democrat Party, Bumjai Thai and uh, Chatai Patana. So we can say very, very confidently, if the Senate is really allowed to vote for the Prime Minister, for sure we know that the Prime Minister will be um, coming from that side of the political division which is representing the government right now. That is why it is so important to see that this is not decided by the Constitution. In this Constitution draft, the possibility of the Senate to vote for the Prime Minister is not contained. That is contained in the second question of the referendum. And that is why the second question of the referendum is of crucial importance. It is the most important thing. Without this question positively answered, the country would be, from the perspective of the government and the people in Thailand who support the government, be really at risk. Because for this perspective it is crucial that continuity is guaranteed. And continuity is only guaranteed, and I have to stress the word guarantee, because it is too important for the country to risk anything. Guaranteed means that the second question has to be answered positively, and that is a really dangerous calculation from that perspective. Um, if the question is answered positively, the consequences are not only that we have um, very probably a government which will be represented by the powers supporting the government right now, but we can also say we have most probably, if there is no major interruption, uh, the rule of this power block until 2026 or 2027. The Senate is creating or pa participating in the creation of the government for five years. And if the election periods are not in, if the second election period is not running to the end, what would not be new in Thailand, because Thaksin was the first prime minister who was running a full period. We can have even three governments, three legislative periods, which are inaugurated under the Senate. And that means that this Senate could for nine years decide about the future governments. Nine years in the future. To see this, um, I think it is important to be aware of the fact that 15 years you need um, approximately to subvert a society. The subversion of the society needs 15 years. This is a knowledge of the Cold War. So if a government wanted to subvert another country, they were calculating with these 15 years. And if you see what happened in Thailand, we have now almost 15 years of subversion from the perspective of the established system started by Thaksin. And we might, from that perspective, need also 15 years of um, getting over that subversion um, happened in the past. That is why national education and um, moral education is so important in this draft. I think um, this is more or less all I want to say. Uh, only one last uh, comment, maybe. In case that the second qu question of the referendum is answered negatively, but we have a draft constitution, and in case that unprobably Poi Thai Party would win the election, we might ask how strong can a government be? 
or in general, how strong can the government be in, under this constitution? Because we saw the parliament will be weak and then the parliamentary system is a weak parliament. We will have a weak government. And there I think the answer is, if we have a Poitai government, it will be very, very weak. They will not be able to run the country under this constitution. If we have a government which is not from Poitai, but which is commanding power base out of the parliamentary system, it might be able to run the country under this constitution. That's all I, I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before, before I open um, the floor to questions, there's a microphone there for anybody who wants to talk. Uh, Henning, why do you think the second question was not included in the draft constitution so that this element of risk was eradicated? I mean, everything else is in there, so why, why would they leave it out as a second question? I don't know. Um, I have um, no idea. I think it is a little bit because um, the process is not totally commanded. It's a process where we have, um, it's, it's not a commanded process. We have a committee and that committee is doing uh, what it can. They, they do the best what, what, what they can and um, there are different opinions in the committees too. There's not only one opinion and um, it might also have to consult with the government to a certain point, that is natural, because the government is behind the committee in a way, it's creating the committee in a way, so there will be some consultation without um, giving orders, but um, consultations will happen. And um, if these consultations happen, it might be signaled that um, there's a certain discontent with uh, the result, and then the discontent will lead to responses. So I think that is why also in the in the first draft, we had a similar thing. We had the so-called crisis panel, which was also lately introduced. Um, the same with the second question, which was lately introduced. And another explanation is, it is to um, go under the cover a little bit of uh, criticism. Right. It is to avoid too much criticism, maybe, too. Right. But it's, I think it is very, uh, very risky to do it like that. Right. Um, we're going to take questions. Before I take the first one, I'd, I'd like everybody in the room who has read the Constitution to raise their hand. We're looking at, I think, maybe 10 people at the outside. It's just interesting. So we're talking Meeting. about... And you. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> the, these ones, of course, are better. Uh, I haven't, but... Uh, question, please. Good evening. My name is Saksit Sayasambad. I'm a correspondent for Channel News Asia. In my previous life, I was a Thai political blogger. Um, first of all, thank you very much, gentlemen, for um, your insights and for your input. Um, of course, we could be talking all evening about all the details and uh, the contents of the draft constitution, for example, um, that we will probably see a continuity of the NCPO, as uh, some, uh, some of you have alluded to, um, for example, that the um, NCPO government uh, or the military government will stay on until a new government is being formed. Um, but my main question is, and one, ha one thing I've been thinking about um, a lot as well is, as we also have seen in the clip um, in the introduction that the insistence and also the emphasis that rights are being preserved, rights are being protected and that uh, rights are being protected even better than before whether it's Thai or foreigners but one thought that I have is no matter what it's written in the constitution all these rights that are being given to the, uh, to the people isn't is there a possibility that these are might be undermined by other laws that we have? You know, for example, the cr criminal laws and uh, stuff like that. Or is it more a problem about inter implementation, interpretation, and execution of the law? Um, David, constitutions trump all laws, right? Mr. Streckfuss? Well, I, I think that every almost every one of those rights also has uh, an exclusion um, for when the state can, it says, by virtue of, of existing law or something to that effect. So all of them, so it depends what the existing law is at the same time. Um, and would we be looking at uh, NCPO announcements? Um, is that an existing law? Um, and so I don't know that, I don't know that the NCPO, I mean, at least its announcements, will continue on in some strange fashion. They do. And so I don't know that any of those rights have any weight given the, the, uh, the exclusions that are built into them. 
Mr. Suji? Well, I would say that uh, there's no real contradiction between uh, rights to put in the constitutions and in the other criminal laws, you see. In other words, as you see, you, you have to bear in mind that there's no uh, total freedom or liberty, you see. Uh, in every country, you see, freedom and liberty must be limited. But the way you limit the way you limit it, it has to be enacted in the statutes or in the law by the parliament. And of course, you see, uh, it has to bear one thing in mind that, that the people would be uh, guarantee uh, a free persons until they were uh, prosecuted and then the sentenced by the court. Then that's something else. But the point is, you see, in our society, it's not the law that is a problem. It's the implementation mm -hmm. of the constitutional law as well as the criminal laws. That's why I point in my uh, presentation that I pointed out that we need to have some reform of the criminal justice system. We have to do that. You see, uh, otherwise, you see, uh, whatever state in the constitutions doesn't mean much. Any, anything to add? Yeah, maybe uh, two remarks. First of all, um, rights we have in every constitution. There is no constitution in the world where we have no rights. That is not the point. Rights are promised in every constitution. Decisive is how we deal with rights pertaining to limitations. We have limitations also wherever we have rights. That's clear. Without limitations, rights are not possible to be guaranteed. But decisive are the restrictions of the limitations of the state. The state itself is restricted in limiting rights. This is section uh, 29 of the last constitution. Yeah, I'm not sure, it's, I think also 29. And these restrictions of the limitations of rights by the state, they are weak. That is basically what we call principle of proportionality. That is uh, what we have in many, many countries. We have it in every European country and in many other constitutions in the world. The principle of proportionality is such a restriction of limitations of rights. This is quite weak in Thailand. And that is one of the reasons why um, rights are not so strongly guaranteed in, in practice. Another thing is um, when you say, uh, what is about the laws? It's the very nature of um, rights to be enforced against laws because the constitution is a supreme law of the land. Theoretically, that is no problem. Theoretically, if there's any law which is violating your rights, as rights are part of the constitution, the constitution is a supreme law of the land, you can destroy these uh, laws. However, this happened in Thailand very, very rarely. The constitutional courts of Thailand very rarely invalidated uh, legal provisions or laws based on the violation of rights. Not many cases. Very famous case is a family name case, but they are not too much. And a third thing is, in Thailand in general, and that is why we cannot blame it so much to a court or anything, in general, laws are not so important. But that there's no mean that we have anarchy. We have other systems of ordering in Thailand. We have them in terms of morality. People, I mean, my law students tell me that. Students of law say, we are not taking written laws too serious because we believe they are instruments of power. But we believe in moral, we believe in Buddhism. And I think to a certain extent that is very right and very true. Thai people are very moral in a way. They follow these rules. They follow these rules because they want to behave morally, not because they want to behave legally. I think this is another thing, that the society in general has a different notion of normative ordering still. And the question is um, how in the future, um, or what is more appropriate in the future for Thailand? That is a totally different question. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay. Hi, Patrick Wynn with Public Radio International. Um, I did sort of read the Constitution, and I noticed that it had the word honest or sisat in it 22, 25 times, something like that. Um, there are provisions in the Constitution <clears throat> that enable the junta loyalist government to uh, ban or purge politicians or officials that are not deemed sufficiently honest, and that's quite vague, so I'd like to hear the panel discuss uh, what are the ramifications of giving them this power? 
It's a real rush to answer this question. <laughs> Not very easy to answer, I see. <laughs> well, uh, sometimes so it's very difficult for, for, for the draft, for the draft uh, members so to say something in, in, the, in the particular aspect, or to, to be more precise. Uh, sometimes, you see, the, 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 the draft writer want to be awake a big thing because they they want to be because they're not very sure that's my personal view is it not very sure whether it would be a a, a good uh, a good uh, version to write it or not you see so so leave it to interpretation and this is the point you see the point is you see sometimes you see the ties lawyers are quite keen in interpreting the the versions in the laws in almost every law you see even it's very specifically put it they are still able to twist it to their own interests so somehow we need to have a a, a very a, a rather powerful and neutral body to uh, to interpret like uh, the constitutional court but uh, uh, in order to to explain more uh, to uh, Henning, uh, I would like to say that the courts cannot pick uh, the issue by itself. They have to wait until complaints coming up from the court or from the other agency. You see, that's why very limited uh, uh, solution come out in terms of uh, how to uh, protect their freedoms and. Uh, liberty of the people uh, guarantee in the constitution. So I don't know whether I, I, I uh, answered your question or not, but, but I'm not the writer in this present draft, so I cannot say much. I was thinking yep. more about the, the danger of allowing this government to say, oh, I deem you un dishonest, so you're out. Yeah. Well, I, let, me, let me answer a slightly different question, but it relates to a, another vague, a vague concept that's Throughout this Constitution, it's not as as prevalent as in the 2000, as the 1997 or 2007 Constitution, but it's democratic regime with king as head of state. This term um, it shows up more operatively here and less formally, in that uh, part of the duty of the government is to uh, educate and create better understanding amongst the people about this form of government. This, that particular phrase was used to, un, to partially un, un, uh, to knock out the, uh, the Puatai government back in 2000. I mean, it was kind of going on from 2013 to 2014. But it was finally said in a uh, constitutional court decision in November of 2014 that somehow, so, it, it is, so it's used a lot, but what does it mean? Just like the honesty, what does it mean? Are there any definitions out there? Um, I think that, they, that there's some sort of conceptual world that you can see the, the broad outlines of in these, in these constitutional court cases or sometimes in a, in, a, in a Supreme Court case on Les Majestés. They're describing something that's hard to get at or describe, but that has some sort of very strong power and, and gets people put in jail for it. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know about that, but I think that that, that, and that's in this phrase too. If anyone suspects that a lawmaker or a law is uh, counter to the democratic regime with the king as head of state, can appeal to the constitutional court for this to be addressed and, and can probably lead to a downfall of government. So I think that when we get into this moral, moral world, it's hard because a lot of these, like Henning is saying that, yeah, why not be moral? It's good to be moral. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we don't all agree on what being moral is, just like we don't know what honest would mean necessarily, or like the democratic regime with the king of head of state. 
maybe one correction I don't judge anything I just describe but I would say indeed um, uh, we work not only in Thailand we work in other countries in South Asia too I think Thai people are really moral they really try to be moral more than maybe other people I know uh, I observe that that people try to be good and they try to do what they think is the right thing however in political terms this is a different thing that is daily life Politically, when you ask for morality and honesty in the constitution, first of all, it is the expression of one of the basic traits of Thai constitutionalism, which is intensified. Thai constitutionalism is conservative, inherently conservative. It tries to preserve the heritage. And that is why we have such a stress on moral issues. And right now, it is not only about preservation, it is about, if you want, uh, reprogramming the society. 15 years, that is what I meant. So 15 years lost and 15 years ahead to um, make sure that these past years are um, counterbalanced. That is why it is so important. And um, indeed, it is uh, very vague and it is a very... Um, it is a very volatile concept which might be used against uh, politicians who are not uh, on the right side. Um, and it is unforeseeable how that will happen and, and, and what is the measure for that totally unforeseeable but that is uh, in general the ex expression of the fact that in Thailand we have um, the notion of good people and good people are people who are loyal to the established system Th that is uh, what good people are so with this provision we have more or less um, said that you have to be loyal to the system that, that is the essence for me, uh, uh, how I understand it. And so just one remark, there will be an ethical standard. The Constitutional Court and all the independent commissions together, according to Section 219 of the Constitution, will set up an ethical standard in which there is at least some um, guideline provided. Good. Question, please. Um, Michael Mackey, freelance. Again, I've not read the Constitution because no one's paid me to. Um, if I just may, a quick comment to a quick question to Dr. Glazer. The um, you mentioned 15 years for subversion. It's a fairly precise term. So I'm just wondering if you could explain where you got that idea from, because my recollection was that. It took Mrs. Thatcher much less than 15 years to seriously subvert Britain's uh, post-Second World War order. And also, if you look at other sort of subversive ideologies, they don't have this clear timeline. So I'm wondering where you got 15 from. And I'm also wondering, and this is an open question to all panelists, are there any mechanisms within the Constitution to stop what could be considered uh, subversion either from within or without. Thanks very much. Right, well it took 40 years to subvert the EU, but... Um yeah, I think uh, 15 years is a, is a sound number in general. Uh, e exactly, the EU uh, is a good example. Um, social democracy in Europe is another example. Uh, neoliberal subversion of social democracy. But the 15 years, this is a, that is a number which is uh, developed by the KGB. The KGB counted with 15 years they would need to subvert a free society. And uh, that's why I have this number. <laughs> But the KGB went out of business. Um, <laughs> any more comments on that? Sorry, that is not empirical. They went out of work. It took more than 15 years to, sub to subvert the Soviet Union. Sorry, right, I think okay. that's erroneous. It's, it, it's a notion. I don't think it's scientific. Um, Marwan. Uh, Marwan Markenmark of the Nikkei Asian Review. Uh, just two questions. Uh, listening to Ajahn Suchit and the others, it seems like you're describing a political culture that those of us from South Asia are familiar with in Pakistan, the notion of the deep state, where democracy is more window dressing. So is that what the constitution of Thailand aspires to? A deep state and democratic activity as sort of window dressing? That's my first question. And given that uh, the, the, the chief draft of the con current constitution is Kun Michai, it will be used to recall that he was also the one who drafted the 1991 constitution that led to the clashes on Bangkok streets because one of the things the people were opposing at the time 
was an appointed prime minister. So are we heading for a crisis, a repeat of 1992, and will it be another mark on, a sort of a black mark on uh, Kun Michai's uh, career as a constitutional scholar? Thanks. Let, let me correct you one thing uh, about the 1991 uh, constitutions and Ajahn Michai. Uh, Ajahn Michai was a chair of the 1991 drafting committee. Yeah. I was one of the members. So, but the, our version, the first version of the draft, of, of the draft is quite democratic, I would say. But uh, we have to submit to the national legislature appointed by the military junta at that time. And Kun Michai and I and there are other people in the drafting committee had had no role in, in it. We just present it. And they just revise this. Revise this until I, I, we couldn't remember <coughs> where, where's my version in it, you see. So, so to be fair with Kun Michai and I myself. So the one who led to a clashes uh, between uh, Kun Sujinda groups and, and, uh, and Kun Shavalit and Kun Chamlong, see, it's not my versions. It's a different one. And, okay, and I what, 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 what is your first question? I, I the concept, I mean, what you described is the notion of the deep state, that the military remains in the background and democratic uh, players are just a uh, window dressing. Oh, I see. Uh, the thing is, you see, uh, what I would like to point out it might be a transitional one because in every constitution in the past or all the constitution in the past you didn't say anything about about military as a as a uh, as a constitutional agency uh, responsible for the for the security but in reality we know that we know that and in this case as well as well uh, they uh, the draft didn't say that doesn't say anything about about the role of the military in ter in times of crisis. They just simply said that uh, if there is something uh, called for, the presidents of the constitutional court will ask the supreme commanders, uh, army chief, the, the prime minister, the house speaker, and all that to sit together and discuss what would be the outcome of the resolution to fight against that uh, uh, undesirable situation. Uh, so they might uh, use the emergency law to allow the military to step in, so on and so forth, because there's no need. There's no need to point it specifically in that. And if we did, like the, the one that, uh, like the first version, the first, the, the first draft that I, I was helping, you see, we, we put it too explicitly. That's why we were criticized. That's maybe one of the reasons that the National Council uh, Reform Council turned it down. Because it's too obvious. Although uh, the military might want that, but it's too obvious. So the, the, the second one is too subtle. So <laughs> maybe subtle. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't want to say much. I don't want to be asked by the NCPO, could you come over here and stay with us for two weeks? <laughs> you get a free haircut. <laughs> um, just if you go back to 1991-92, um, when that constitution became effective and there was an elected prime minister, which was in fact, uh, sorry, there was a prime minister in place, which was Suchinda as it turned out, the, um, the junta vanished. There was an automatic expiry. With this system, when does the junta disappear? When does the junta cease to exist? Is it this one? This one? Yeah. Once the, once the, I'm not very sure, but once the election was held, I guess, and the new government, uh, the new government was put in place, then the NCPO would be out. But. The orders of NCPO, all the rules set by the NCPO, if they were not, if they are not nullified mm -hmm. by the parliament, they're still in effect. Does anybody know? 
that, I don't. I don't think. Uh, though maybe a uh, Henning. Who's Henning knows. Henning was, there, was, there, was there a, in that transitory in that transition? Does it? Doesn't say much does it? Does it knock out the NCPO? It doesn't say directly. Does, I mean, does it? Yeah. Explicitly. The, yes. The NCPO is in tra in charge until a new government is is formed, and then the NCPO is to so it just evaporates. It says yes. that. Right. Yeah. Yes. So that's yeah. one of the. Mm. Yeah. But don't forget, they may put themselves in the Senate. Well, they will be in the well, Senate, they will for sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. They'll be in Senate. <laughs> I, I want to respond to Marwan's question. I don't think that, I mean, it's not just this constitution, but I don't think that Thai society is in a place to reconcile because there wasn't any efforts by the powers that be to try to bring together these Sutape groups and these red shirt groups and and do anything significantly i don't think they even bother trying to complain that they've <coughs> established reconciliation so i think that the hurt's still out there i don't know if it takes 15 years to kind of subvert and destroy whatever had happened over the last 10 years but we're definitely not in any better place and i don't know that this constitution has the pieces in it to to establish a reconciliation in in, in itself. Questions? Maybe yeah, one there? remark to the deep state. Um, may I? Yes. Sure. Uh, the deep state is a quite interesting concept. Um, it is uh, the deep state describes a combination of uh, intelligence, military, politics, economics, and organized crime. It's coming from Turkey. The concept, and I think for Thailand, the concept is um, not really suitable. Every state has a shadow of power. In every state we have informal politics. We have in every state intelligence agencies operating and they are always somehow connected to other power centers in the society. But for Thailand I think it is not uh, particularly significant to talk about a deep state in Thailand. Because we have these groups in Thailand, but they are not so coherent, not so organized, like they are in many other states. I think that is exactly the expression of uh, the Thai order. The Thai order, the established Thai order was a spontaneous order. And the charm of the system, uh, which is uh, waning now somehow, was that we have many different power centers. And the, these power centers were all in a certain balance and that they were recreating themselves. And the charm for the broad elite was that everyone was able to get in power sometime because the positions were given only for some time but everyone was getting a position and if you take for example the military commander only for a short time your military commander for two years sometimes you are appointed one year before your retirement and after your retirement you are out of power in other countries in Indonesia and in Cambodia and Myanmar much more power bases are built up from these positions for much longer time. Mm -hmm. So there are much more coherent networks in the dark. In every country we have that shadow, but in Thailand I think it is not specifically uh, describing uh, the situation. Um, it's, it's, it's just the same for every country. It's always very interesting to look for the deep state in every country. <coughs> so maybe it's a soft deep state here. Yeah. Uh, question. Yes, given uh, Jan Sukit's point at the beginning that an election will happen anyway, um, how will those events unfold over the next year? Um, Pardon me? How? Um, given your event, uh, you, at the beginning you said that the election will happen anyway. Yeah. Yes. Um, how will the events unfold if the new constitution is not passed? So how would we get to the election next year if, if the constitution doesn't go through? You're, you're convinced there will be an election one way yes, or another? Yes, my, my point is to see uh, if the, the present draft you see, uh, failed to pass uh, the referendum, I would think that N NCPO would, uh, would try to do something to enact you see, a new one. And it's not very difficult for them because this time they don't want to go for a referendum, they don't want to go for a, a huge a, a draft committee so on and so forth. They, they might pick up uh, only a few of the people, you see, and then, okay, but then you look at the past, uh, in the past three or four constitutions, and then you just mix it up, amend it, and so on and so forth, and then uh, put it to effect. So this, this, this would be one of the things that NCPO will, uh, will do, that's my belief, uh, because it's not very 
easy uh, for NCP to do anything to postpone the elections because the pressure within the country and the outside is very strong and the Prime Minister always emphasized uh, 20, 2017, 2017 all the time all the time so it's not very easy for him uh, to say oh I cannot uh, give you election because you didn't uh, try to uh, to pass it in the to pass the draft in the referendum so not the point mm -hmm. my point is you see I think uh, Kun Prayut uh, is quite keen uh, keen to to, uh, to to do anything that election uh, will be held but to what extent but the question is that to what extent the military is still in in that uh, the so-called quote-unquote elected government Dr. Chit, you've watched all these things over the years. It's quite noticeable that Prayut's had it over two years now. And if you compare that to Suchinda, uh, for example, 91, that was only 14 months. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it was uh, a little bit longer, I think 16 months. These were very short blips. And then, as you say, they moved on because they didn't yes. overstay their welcome, which is a great tradition. Why do you think uh, General Prayut has done relatively well and being tolerated for that length of time and in fact there's not you know there's, there's a lot of grumbling but there's no serious push to get rid of him well uh, it's not very easy to say anything about this you see uh, uh, well uh, at first as he couldn't produce when he came to power people had has a quiet uh, belief in him that he might be the one who do any anything to get rid of those the so-called undesirable element, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because when he, w when he was a, a, a commander of army, or he, when he was a commander of troops uh, in, the, in the eastern uh, border, he was a quite tough guy. The way he speak, the way he uh, put forward his ideas, it, it reminds people about Kun Sarit, Tanarat. I don't know whether you people know Sarit or not, but I myself, see, when I was a in the college when Sarit came to power and my god he's quite strong but he cannot he couldn't do anything with us when we were students he tried to please us as a students you see and and also professor but but he quite tough and people believe that but uh, you see uh, Kun, Kun Prayut had to compromise a bit because Thai society is quite uh, diversify compared to those in Sarit time, Thanom times or Kun uh, Suchinda. So it's not very easy to, to, uh, to do anything what he want. And the other thing, I don't know whether I can say here or not, but uh, whether he can't, uh, they said, you see, that there's no friction among military juntas. There's no frictions among uh, the military leaders. Uh, it might be true. The friction cannot occur because everything needs to do collectively. Kun uh, Prayut might be the one who speak, but he can speak with collectiveness among the, the, the those who are in, in power. So it's not very easy uh, for anybody to dictate that we have to do this, we have to get rid of this, we have to do that. Because you know quite well that if you look at the member of NCPO, each one has his own con a connection with politicians. Right, question? My name is Liam Cochran. I work for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Given the limited debate that's been allowed about the referendum and the draft constitution, given the complicated wording of the second question, to what extent do you think when Thai people go to vote on Sunday, they will actually be voting on whether they approve of the military government or not? Why don't you ask those who don't go to vote? <laughs> the two gentlemen. <laughs> I would be the one who vote. So <laughs> I can't say anything, Dominic. <laughs> Well, let me say, you see, use example of the last referendum on the constitution in uh, uh, 20, uh, what, 
uh, the, the, the last constitution when we had uh, 2007 yeah, yeah it's right 2007 you see uh, people ask me many times to see you see well shall we vote shall we vote see and people complain that uh, they didn't read anything big thick that big thick you see the constitution so most of the time that we uh, talk with uh, in uh, 2007 they go to they went to vote for the constitution because they said we need a constitution and if it happened to be not very good for the country well we can amend it so a number of people go there with the political idea in their mind not the merit not the content but they think about the consequences of the ones uh, after the referendum if you prefer this okay you might go for for it if you prefer that you might against it so it's the political agenda that count but the, sorry, do you, I'd like you, David, to pick up on this. It's a very important point, this idea that you kick the can down the road. It's not a perfect constitution, but you accept it because you can change it. But this one, you can't. This is, this is the key issue. So it's right. very rigid. Okay. Now, if you go back to 2007, constitutional crisis, the, the whole 1997 thing went into wobble. It didn't work. So it was a coup. Get rid of it. You come forward to 2014, you have the same problem. Um, it, 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 they wanted to establish a, a Senate, a super cabinet to come in, replace the England government. They couldn't do it legally. The constitution was a block. You have a coup to get rid of it. So if you have this kind of rigidity built into the system, are you simply con a condemning Thailand to a cycle of coups that you will have okay, to have another coup? Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, it depends on uh, if you really study the constitutions, then uh, you might vote objectively uh, whether these constitutions, with the draft, is good for for the country or not, so on and so forth. See, but if you don't want to read it, or if you don't care much, then just listen to the to the the, the government policy and so on and so forth. To see announcements, so on and so forth, and you go for it. Which means that okay, you go for it because you like Kun uh, Prayut to be to be in power for at least for some time. That might be possible. That's why that the people think in terms of they have political agenda in their mind. So if you don't like, then something else different. But the point is that raised by handing about about the the additional question. It's quite interesting to me that nobody talk much about additional question when I talk to the people see they didn't they didn't say much about and the the draft committees the drafting committee didn't say much either on on the on the on this issue and it seemed to me the additional questions the issue raised in additional of different seem to be more important seem to me important <laughs> perhaps than the constitution itself at least for the time being for the transitional time, for the transitional period. But it's quite interesting to see what would happen if I vote for the constitution and I don't know and leave it blank for the additional questions. So that, that's a good question. Henning, can you just uh, take on that question of over rigidity, uh, inability to adapt, and whether it takes us into a cycle of coups? returns us to a cycle of good. Yeah, maybe um, the point is not so much uh, if this constitution is forever. If this constitution would really last for a long time, I think there would have to be uh, a change which would be violent uh, in one or the other way. There could be a coup, but there could also be uh, uprising, insurgency, something like that is possible, or protracted violent political crisis, because still many people uh, are on the other side. Um, so th this is really the, the risk of, of the country, not of the constitution, of the whole country. But I think the constitution, the question if the constitution will be supported or not, is very much a question about what people think is the best choice right now in the transitional time uh, Thailand is witnessing. I think that is the most important question. People will not look in the details of the constitution. People will simply ask themselves, is this constitution saving us over transition, yes or no? That's it. Because transition is a national catastrophe. 
It's an earthquake. It's not only about, when people always talk about uh, social conflict or class conflict in Thailand, it's true, but it's only one half of the truth. The full truth is, this is an interface conflict we have here. It's an interface conflict with the whole danger of an interface conflict. And uh, in this conflict, people will really ask um, if the constitution which is coming will save the country over transition, yes or no. Th that is the most important question. David, do you want the last word? Yeah. The, um, a lot of red shirts remember being fooled by what they were told in 2007. They were told, a lot of Pua Thai politicians in the Northeast said, go ahead and vote for it, and we'll change it later. And it turned out they couldn't change it later. So a lot of people remember that. For a number of people, and I don't know the, the, the percentage, they are going to vote against this constitution because it's illegitimate and it shouldn't even be up for a referendum. Some feel so alienated by the illegitimacy of this of this referendum that they're not going to vote at all. Um, but my driver on the way to the airport today, I asked him how he's going to vote. He said, you know, I wasn't going to vote, but I keep thinking if I don't, they're going to stay in power either way. If I don't vote, um, or if I, if I vote yes, it will, it will confirm to, the, to them their power. So I'm going to go and vote no. Um, and I don't know how that's going to turn out, but a lot of people are thinking that this is not, not, not the Constitution to vote for, but mm. on principle. Well, I think that wraps it. Um, we, we don't know what's going to happen on Sunday. Um, okay, sure. We will be back next Thursday um, to try and pick the bones out of it, and we'll have some very interesting people to talk to you. Um, so, David Strackfuss, Suchit Bumonkan, Henning Glazer, thank you very much for a very intriguing thank you.